While the dawn age of Toril, as detailed in Volume 4 of our Forgotten Realms history, saw many significant events that all helped shape Faerun, there were also many other notable events taking place across other worlds and upon foreign planes of existence, each both interesting and also historically significant. This is one such tale. Within the storied history of these realms, few tales of this era are as stirring or as divisive and paradoxical as that of Prince Durathil, who as legend claims was believed to be the first dragon rider, and yet that is not his only contribution to the historical record. While his story is certainly a saga of courage and redemption, one often repeated with the same story beats you've likely heard before. What is often not highlighted properly, or even mentioned in its telling, is a strong negative undercurrent, as a tale of unchecked and selfish ambition, all in the pursuit of power, something we will look to rectify today. This narrative, still worthy of inclusion among any collection of children's fables, unfolds in an era when the realms were younger, wilder, and of course teeming with the magic and danger of a realm still dominated by dragons and giants in equal measure. This was a time when the fate of entire kingdoms and civilizations could be altered by the whims of the powerful and dominant forces lording over the still emerging humanoid races. Our story will begin on the island of Tentagir, located far away, even off-world according to some, in the realm of the fairy, that you might know better as the Feywild in today's lexicon. This is a tale that checks all the boxes of a made-for-Hollywood movie script. Disasters, dark forces, emerging heroes, betrayal, and noble intentions. And just like a good Game of Thrones book, someone has to die. A legend poised to captivate and enthrall. This is the complicated and obscure saga of Prince Durathil, the first dragon rider. A sprawling island city in the ethereal embrace of the Plain of Fairy, Tintagir stood as the pinnacle of the Gold Elf civilization circa negative 25,400 Dale Reckoning. A shimmering jewel amidst the azure embrace of the surrounding sea, Tintagir was home to an elven people whose history was as ancient as the bedrock upon which its islands stood. Hailed as a city where magic and nature intertwined in an exquisite balance of beauty and harmony, it was written that the spires of Tintagir, crafted from the purest silver and adorned with gems that capture the eternal twilight of the Feywild, pierced the sky with their majesty each sunrise and sunset. The gleaming metropolis was known for its vast, lush gardens, comprising a vibrant kaleidoscope of colors with flowers that sang and trees that whispered ancient secrets to those who would just sit and listen. And it was here on this elven island, thought to be the most populous in all the realm of fairy, that a prince and the future archmage and dragon rider was born into a lineage as venerable as the city itself. Prince Durothil's was a heritage of kings and queens who had ruled Tintagir with wisdom, guardians of a legacy that spanned a millennia. Yet for such an historical event and the lore of the Forgotten Realms, your narrator finds it odd that in my extensive research, no record of the prince's full and complete name can be found. All references list him as Prince Durothil or simply Durothil. And that is not as one might easily infer due to a significant lack of lore or possibly the obscure nature on the history of this elven house of Durothil. Quite the contrary, there exists ample historical lore on many members of this founding House of the Gold Elves, many of whom would go on to join the armies and wizards of Evermeet. From Roland Durathil, the first patriarch of the family, to the famed warrior Ilianaro Durathil, best known for wielding Redethamar, the legendary magical axe said to hold the spirit of an elven goddess. And if you have any experience with the Tyranny of Dragons comic, you're also likely familiar with the mischievous Nemestra Durathil. No, this lack of full context on the princely heir to the throne of Tintagir and the first house of Durathil to settle upon Faerun remains a perplexing mystery to this very day. The people of Tintagir were artisans of life and magic. They lived in harmony with a land that embodied its own innate power often visible in the perpetual twilight, their practice of the arcane arts a melody that resonated with the very songs of their world. The council mages of Tintagir were unrivaled, 
their mastery of high magic born from a deep connection to Mistral's magical weave, the source of all magic in realm space. It was this profound bond that allowed them to craft wonders that defied imagination, from living structures that grew and evolved to portals that bridged the vast distances between worlds. Yet for all its beauty and splendor, Tintagir was not immune to the vicissitudes of fate or the covetous gazes of those who would seek to conquer such a shining gem. And so it came to pass, a significant yet mysterious event history would later record as the Siege of Tintagir. While many important details such as the cause and even the perpetrators of this siege were left buried under the realm's ocean depths, we know that some dark force descended upon the Gold Elf homeland like a tempest unleashed from the darkest depths of the ocean abyss. Waves of invaders, relentless and cruel, crashed against the island's defenses, each assault more ferocious than the last. In the aftermath, as the smoke cleared and the last enemy ship splintered beneath the unforgiving sea, a ragged cheer, born as much from relief than vitriol, escaped from those that survived said to total barely 100 in all. Yet even this respite faded almost instantly, strangled by the sight of ruin and devastation. This once majestic city, a crown jewel of the fairy splendor, now lay shattered and bleeding. It was only then, in that very silence of loss, that the true terror seized them. The victorious blow, a high magic ritual meant to sweep the invaders from the elven shores, was now a beast unbound. The result, a cataclysmic tidal storm. In dread echoes and cruel mockery, the ocean around their homeland swelled, seethed, and churned. It was then that a single cry shattered the terrified silence. Despair set into the eyes of the Golden Elf survivors as their once distant shores were now rapidly encroached upon with voracious hunger as the swelling tide rushed forward with abyssal fury engulfing and obliterating everything in its path, leaving only ruin, despair, and death in its wake. Even as they watched in horror, the hungry sea surged forward to claim the land that had been theirs for millennia. It wasn't the invaders that stole their home, it was the unleashed rogue power meant to protect it, and with each relentless crash, the ocean erased more ancient elven history, swallowing entire streets, homes, and lives. Realization can be a cruel herald. The island, their beloved home, was now dying. The young boy Prince Durathil stood among what remained of his people amidst this chaos. Though elven years scarcely touched his face, his eyes now held an ancient grief. His family, rulers bound to this land by oaths older than starlight, now lay quiet beneath the encroaching sea. It was now only he that bore the mantle of a lineage on the very brink of extinction. His voice, though tinged with youthful uncertainty, also held the authority of his birthright as he commanded his people towards the dancing hill. The order wasn't questioned, even amongst the crushing grief. There was a quiet dignity in the prince, a spark of desperate hope that held them back from the brink of despair. The Dancing Hill, so named as one of the prominent gathering spots for elven magic and ritual casting, often taking the form of emotive dance. And just as important now, it was the highest geographical point on the island, and thus offered the best hope of a haven until the unnaturally high waters receded. Each frantic stumble from the flooding ruins toward the sacred hill was a step through memories. Here a shattered fountain where children laughed, there a broken arch where lovers promised eternity. As they reached the summit of their hopeful sanctuary, the air thrummed with the ancient, almost tangible magic of the weave. The dancing hill well renowned as the sacred ground where the magic of the multiverse was most concentrated. But the hope was short-lived as the ground beneath them began to rumble, not the harmonious song of the island, but the scream of their home tearing itself asunder. In that heart-stopping moment, every elf on that hill then understood. Tintagir, their beloved jewel, would face its final song beneath the waves. Summoning all his courage and amplifying his voice to overcome the thundering death throes of the island, 
Dorothil looked upon the priestess Bonaluri and commanded everyone to dance. Jolting the priestess from her grief-stricken haze, his eyes, filled with wisdom beyond his years, met hers knowingly, and in moments igniting her own desperate flicker of understanding, together their voices rallying the shattered survivors. This was no battle cry, but a plea to that ancient magic to be channeled through their very blood. In a circle upon that sacred hill, a dance of defiance soon began. Bonaluri, though not a mage, was grateful for her past interest in the high magic knowledge required for such a ritual. The priestess called upon the last echoes of her own goddess Angaroth, her voice offering a fragile hope as she wove the intricate, forlorn steps of this forgotten spell. They danced the high magic spell of seeking. The wounded, the children, Every heart poured itself into this ritual, fueled by fear, yes, but also an unshakable love for their lost home, their lost heritage, and now their very existence. The cleric Bonaluri sang, her voice weaving the essence of each elve into a singular thread of raw, chaotic magic, bolstered by tapping into the concentrated, innate note of the weave on that sacred hill. But this was not the work of the careful, tuned minds of practiced, high magic wizard circles. This was a determined yet desperate gamble, guided by a priestess and not a mage. They danced and sang until their voices were no more than silent whispers against the crashing and oncoming waves. And then they each saw it. A shimmer like molten mercurial silver, a tearing wound opening where the world should be whole. Yet with every note they felt the drain. Elves stumbled, some fell, forms growing ghostly and wraith-like as the spell consumed them. Bonaluri held the center, but her face too had grown grave and ashen. A living sacrifice made at the altar of her people's salvation. The ocean rose above the horizon, its black undulating curtains of dark waves blotting out the setting sun. Then, just as the monstrous wall consumed that hill, the island and an ancestry, reality ripped apart, casting those who remained standing, these last remnants of the gold elf civilization, into that shimmering silver void of Feywild magic. Swept into the prismatic tunnel, their dire lament still echoing against the crashing waves as Tintagir was forever lost beneath the waves. Silence, for what seemed like an eternity, followed by a harsh jolt and brutal landing. Durathil lay sprawled upon the unforgiving rocky earth of a realm foreign to his birthright. Pain rippled through him, but he ignored it, eyes drawn not to threats, but to the missing faces among the survivors. His last vision was the ghostly imprint of Bonaluri, eyes closed in peaceful exhaustion. Though the priestess had fallen, she had carved a path forward for her people a final act of devotion that had brought them here from the cusp of annihilation. It was in her memory they would march on. But Durathil was not sure where here was. In the wake of Tintagir's destruction, barely more than 50 of the 100 upon that hill emerged upon this mountainous vista of a new world far from the shores of their homeland. They'd paid a terrible price for passage, standing on foreign and unknown ground but alive, in a land that whispered of untold dangers and perhaps possibilities. This world was strange, stark in its rugged beauty against the shimmering memory of the fairy. And yet, even in this alien realm, the young prince knew his legacy wasn't erased. This place wasn't home, but he could forge it into one, and it was in this spirit he surveyed their new domain. Majestic mountains pierced the clouds, the dwindling sunlight glinting off peaks like frozen fire. Below, vibrant meadows of many colors gave way to dark green forests, and beneath all, a crystal blue river snaked through the valley. And most importantly, Durothel felt the familiar raw energy of the weave, present here as it was at home. His kingship might have been born in ruins, but their future would be written on new ground. It wouldn't be easy, but then his people never cowered from overcoming the harsh hand of fate. Faerun he spoke the name aloud and repeated it with a nod. Faerun, an elegant echo of the homeland they'd lost, now shaped into something defiant, 
This was not Tentagear, it never would be. But with magic flowing through its veins, this land, Faerun, would become something more. Now up to this point in our story, I have mostly refrained from my own speculation and attempting to stay true to the story as intended. But here I think it would be irresponsible of me to not at least add some context to such a claim as this child prince being THE origin for the name Faerun. Additionally, I would like to proffer some discussion along the lines of my own hesitance with this seemingly canonical lore. To be clear, I'm not questioning the veracity of the claim, as at least one moderately supported in-game origin for the naming of this region of the Forgotten Realms. We know that Faerun is derived from the word fairy, and that the elven migrations we've covered thus far and will continue to cover as we move forward in this series originate from the fairy realm. Some would posit with good argument that the fairy is not a realm or a plane at all, but in fact another world, a great discussion to have, but not one we're going to have today. Regardless, all this makes it very easy to fully support that the land was named by the migrating elves and maybe by this boy prince. But stepping outside of the lore for just a moment is where I take issue, or better stated, really just have some questions that I want to share with you. For example, in the source for this claim, it's clearly written in black and white in the story from the 1999 novel Evermeet Island of the Elves by Elaine Cunningham. Now, that alone does not make it an officially fully endorsed canon as we know from Wizards' most recent statements, although I'm quick to admit that I was not able to find a more credible source for any alternative origin. So if this is the accepted canonical lore, well, it just strikes me as a complete miss to have such gaps in the surrounding lore of something as important as the naming of the most popular region of the most popular realm of the game's official setting within Dungeons & Dragons. We just have so little information on Prince Durathil, like even his full name. And while I really enjoyed reading the book, twice in fact, so much so I went out and bought the hardcover of it, it's still one of the few sources of this prince and his lore, a prince who is possibly the canonical source for one of the most famous words in all of the Forgotten Realms. Now I know we have some far more well-versed novel readers out there than myself, so I am completely accepting that I've missed something, obvious or obscure. Just please don't tell me it's buried in some 4E lore somewhere. But there are thousands of novels and likely hundreds of adventures I've not read, although I've read a lot of modules, but perhaps I have missed something. And if I have, please hit me up down below or in an email. We'll figure it out. Okay, on with the lore. Prince Durathil observed this mountainous ground beneath them to be peculiar. The plateau on which they stood was remarkably flat, almost too flat to be of natural origin, and it was nearly as level as a floor. Further, its texture did not seem to be of any natural stone he had ever seen in Tentagear. It was smooth, almost slick, with a sheen like that of polished marble. Yet there were also odd lumps here and there. Ever curious, the young prince drew his dagger and began to chip away at one of the anomalies. The stone yielded like glass under his blade, breaking away to reveal a charred, oddly shaped metal. Upon freeing a slender metal cylinder from the stone, the silent yet familiar hum of magic signaled its enchanted nature. His discovery grew more mysterious as he unearthed the remains of a sword hilt beneath this cylinder. His concentration on these newly found items was only broken by a stranger's voice, claiming the remnants to be of elven make. An elf with a starkly different look emerged to survey the found artifacts. With pale skin and flaming red hair, Durothil would later learn this merchant, possibly a pirate, was named Charlario Moonflower. The stranger elf not of Durothil's people was simply caught in the Tintagir port during the siege. His demeanor and the lack of any formal etiquette when addressing a prince showed he held no reverence for the heritage or status of this boy prince. However, that did not detract from the shared intrigue both held for these relics entombed within the stone. Minutes passed as they mused about the origins of the metal artifacts when suddenly, Tarlario's eyes widened in dread realization as he shouted out to all the vicinity to descend from this plateau and take cover. His voice distressed and urgent, they were all in grave danger. 
The young prince's pride bristled at the command, challenging Charlario's authority to issue such directives, until the pale elf bluntly explained to the boy that the peculiarities of this mountain and the destroyed artifacts whispered unspoken words of warning. It was the work of Dragonfire. Acknowledging the immediate danger, Durathel conceded, rallying the elves to heed Charlario's warning. As he commanded the evacuation, the young prince's gaze caught a glimpse of movement on the distant horizon to the west. There, shadowed against the sky, a black speck was rapidly assuming the form of a dragon, igniting paralyzing dread within him. Resolved to confront his fate head-on as any good king would, Durathil drew his sword and prepared to make a stand. Not with any expectation of victory, but as a final act of defiance, to safeguard his people. Beside him, Charlario too readied himself for a confrontation, though Durathil noticed his attention was captured by another, closer threat. Winged humanoid beings were descending upon them and holding nets, intent to capture. Before he could react, Charlario sent the prince out of harm's way and over the precipice of the plateau, the young boy tumbling down the mountainside. Pain exploded across Durathil's body in the chaotic descent. Upon landing, his vision began to dim into the gray, foggy void of unconsciousness. The last image in the prince's quickly fading vision was that of Charlario struggling within the nets of his captors as he was carried away by these winged hunters into a darkening sky. In the deep, hidden embrace of Faerun's northern forest, time flowed indifferent to the plights of elves, whims of giants, or rage of dragons. Seasons became years until finally the surviving Durathil was returned to his people. The historic record offers very little reason or cause for such an extended absence from his people, although I, along with many a sage and scholar, can offer speculation. From lost memories due to his fall, or perhaps the root cause lies buried deep inside the mind of what we must remember was a child, a young boy faced with the loss of his entire family, his lineage, his homeland, and then thrust into such a weighty burden. Regardless, we are certainly left with some gaps in the lore that I can only attempt to address as we move forward. What we do know is that, at least according to the elven texts that we do have, Durathil was eventually found deep in the northern wilds by a group of Lithari. Lithari are these fabled and good-aligned lycanthropic elves. They offered him sanctuary and guidance and ultimately a return to his people. However, Durathil's youth had completely slipped away. He had grown into adulthood. But he did so with the memories and spirit that remained as the child prince who had guided a shattered people out of a dying homeland. And it was during these mostly unexplained and lost years, away from his responsibilities of leadership, as well as any immediate threats to his people, that I would posit Durathil's path at least began its turn towards a conflict of self. Finally reunited with his people, he found himself a prince without a crown, a would-be king without subjects. The now adult gold elf discovered a community that had learned to survive, even thrive, without him. His people had moved on beyond his leadership. And it's here that I'll take a moment to try and narrow down one of the biggest questions that I personally had upon reading this story in Elaine Cunningham's book on which much of this lore is based many years ago. It's very easy to get confused when asking the question of how long Durathel was actually separated from his people. The book simply states that the Wheel of Seasons turned many times, indicating obviously at least years. And we also know that he was a boy when he was knocked off that plateau, and he returns as an adult. So, five, ten years, perhaps? Well, that was the human-centric mistake I made upon my first reading over 20 years ago. Of course, I know now that the key is to think about the passage of time from the lens of an elven lifetime, which, of course, greatly surpasses that of us humans. There are so many clues that I missed back then that made my recent reread actually quite satisfying. For example, Durathil learns that during his long absence, the Golden Elves had discovered, met, allied, and even intermingled with other elven races, such as the Wild Green Elves, 
and the Illithir that had migrated to this realm centuries earlier. So much intermingling, in fact, that the label Gold Elf had all but vanished as they now refer to themselves as Sun Elves. Charlario not only survived that fateful day upon the plateau, but in fact those winged beings were the elven Avariel, and the Nets were there to rescue, not capture. The flame-haired elven warrior went on to wed a devout priestess of Sihanin Moonbow, and together produced an entire brood of pale-skinned, red-haired elves just like their father and now they were referred to as Moon Elves, as this was in fact the origin story for their creation upon Faerun. All these transpired events of course take time, far more than a few years. Now that information alone would be enough to convince you that in fact decades, not seasons or years, had passed in Durofil's absence and his subsequent return. However, I was surprised in my own research to learn that in fact you would count the time of Durofil's absence in centuries, something I'll explain as we end this volume. So his people had adapted to the challenges of a new land, forged alliances with other elven tribes and civilizations, and established a true semblance of stability. Durathel even learned that the red dragon he spotted on the horizon that fateful day had been defeated and banished, but its story is far from over. Nonetheless, all these realizations were a bitter pill for a prince who had envisioned his return as the reclamation of his role as leader. Indeed, Durathil's sense of obsolescence within his own community would serve as a catalyst for his subsequent journey into the depths of the Underdark, fueled by ambition and a building animus towards any and all responsible for the loss of his divine birthright. Among the many draconic forces present in Faerun during the Dawn Age, the Great Red Dragon, Mahatn Artorian, stands as an early symbol of the rage of dragons that would come, as well as the chaos and fear that would forever embody the character traits of these chromatic dragons to this very day. Known among the early green elves of Faerun as the Master of Mountains, Mahatn Artorian was among the mightiest from that time of dragons when these children of Bahamut and Tiamat ruled the skies of the realm. The great red dragon with scales the color of crimson molten fire was perhaps the most notable of the early dragon lords, and history would record him as being so powerful that he was impervious to all but the mightiest of steel and spells alike. From his lair among the craggy mountain peaks of Faerun, he surveyed his domain with an all-consuming avarice, ever seeking to expand his territory and his horde. According to the writings of elven scholars, Mahatn Artorian was cruel even by the standards of his contemporary evil dragon lords, and his encounters with elven settlements, starting with the first Illithiri migrations centuries earlier, had always been marked by bloodshed and destruction. Other dragons, having previously battled their own in the Draco Holy Wars and now fully engaged in the Grand War against the northern giants of Astoria, gave little thought to these smaller humanoid creatures who dwelt upon their lands. Even the most sinister of chromatic dragon lords thought of themselves as rulers, the benign lords over their weaker humanoid subjects, many even brokering official peace treaties with the elves. But Mahatna Torian was the outlier. He viewed the elves and their settlements not as subjects or even rivals, but as infestations, his prey, nothing more than sources of food and treasure to feed his insatiable hunger. The Great Worm's wrath had been relentless and brutal, his name becoming a curse upon elven tongues whispered among the communities of the north as their lands and settlements burned under his shadow. But at least for a time, the elves found temporary reprieve from the banished menace. Catching up on all that had transpired during his absence, Charlario explained to Durathil that Mahatn Artorian was in fact the same great red dragon that had blasted the mountaintop plateau upon their arrival to Faerun so many years ago. As Durathil came to understand all aspects of this conflict, the dragon had been bested in battle and sent into exile by the winged Avariel elves with Charlario's assistance hailing the Moon Elf as a hero among the elven communities. 
While many of the details have been lost to the millennia that followed, we do know it was during this era that each of the myriad of dragon types began to separate and form their own distinct individuality. And it was in this divergence of character that some dragons, like the blue and red worms, were instilled with what can only be described as a certain moral code of respect and honor when it comes to battle while other variants such as the black dragons devolved into sinister cruelty born mostly of lies and deceit. While there was little immediate worry of Mahatnatorian breaking his vow of banishment, red dragons were still evil and treacherous creatures who honored that code only with great reluctance, and the term of his exile was near to expire. The future was clear, the master of the mountain would soon seek to exact his vengeance. This revelation ignited Durathil's own ambition, empowering the mage to seek a darker path by which he might regain the power and status that was lost, his crown, his divine birthright. Durathil began spending most of his time away from the community, hidden away in his own modest mage tower built of a tree near the mountaintop plateau where he and the moon elf had first encountered the master of the mountain in that distant past. But it has also been speculated by some that the Gold Elf Mage may have traveled to the darker corners of the realm, and perhaps even crossed deep into the Underdark as he sought out new, darker powers. Durathil vowed when the Master of the Mountain returned, he would be there to meet him, and the restoration of his birthright to lead his people once again would be one on the wings of a dragon. Armed with knowledge from powerful southern elven mages that Mahatan Artorian was highly resistant to their magic, Durathil, even as a powerful archmage in his own right, knew his innate elven magic would have little impact on the master of the mountain. So began his quest, to seek alternative paths by which he might acquire new forms of power to gain dominance over the Great Red Dragon. Now, depending upon your source and likely the inherent bias of the various scholarly authors who have penned this tale, either Durathil felt Mahatan Artorian was an imminent threat to the survival of his community, therefore leaving the former prince with no choice but to pursue whatever path was required, a selfless act of sacrifice for his people regardless of the stain it might cast upon his soul. Or it was a combination of blind animus-fueled ambition and the acrimony of all that was taken from him. That would now lead Durathil beyond those more traditional paths and into the darkened realms of knowledge that bordered on or even stepped into the forbidden. Whatever your own judgment, we know Durathil, driven by a desire to assert control over the dragon that threatened his people while also regaining his lost crown, sought favor a pact with a higher form, and curiously, he bargained with a formidable and wholly chaotic source, an evil said to exist even before Lord Ao's time. The Ancient One, that which lurks, the Lord of Slime, and the Greater God of Abominations. I speak of Gonador. Seeking to strike a bargain with this chaotic evil Greater God of Abominations was a desperate bid, and most certainly a gamble. Some write the chaotic evil god made first contact, looking to corrupt an innocent soul. Others maintain the mage delved into the darkness of his own inner drive. Regardless, forged in the depths of such shadows, a grim agreement was struck, one that promised Durathil the power and leverage that he sought over Mahatnatorian, but at a very steep cost. But it's the details of this pact, specifically that cost, that should open one's eyes. In exchange for the might needed to confront Mahatnatorian, Durathil would deliver to Ganador a sacrifice. Now, history provides us no insight on the details of any negotiations with Ganador, although we do have various texts that offer a range of speculations. Some plainly state that the agreement with Ganador was clear, a life for a life. Others go on to paint that the price of this pact was not made lightly, that Durathil, fully aware of the potential consequences, but confident in his plan, viewed the cost as a necessary evil. While other diametrically opposed and far more pro-Elven texts read a little bit like propaganda, suggesting Durathil was completely unaware, and that no price was demanded or agreed at the time the pact was made, I guess believing that this chaotic evil lord of slimes 
was actually quite benevolent. Still, all tales leave one to ponder the potentially unspeakable, even betraying nature of this dark bargain struck. Was Durathil driven by the plight of the Sun Elves to pursue such a dark path, all in a noble effort to stop an evil draconic force from eradicating his people? Or was this the myopic, unchecked pursuit of power and the restoration of his legacy? Only tangentially related, but in my opinion adding fuel to the fire, one only has to look at the story of the Draco Rage Mythal that we covered in Volume 4 of our Forgotten Realms history to reasonably and plausibly conclude that perhaps the Elves might have been plotting against the Draconic forces from the very moment they emerged from that first Feywild portal. The true answer to these questions, unfortunately, is forever lost, wrapped in the veiled bias that resides in the mind of each writer and reader of this tale. In the hushed stillness of dawn, it's fitting that we're once again upon that same plateau that both robbed Durathil of his birthright and started the former prince down his ambitious path of inner conflict, redemption, and reclamation. Each morning, Durathil approached the ledge of that plateau to gaze across the horizon, still no sign of the red-winged menace. But this dawn, he caught a familiar scent, one of musk and sweet citrus. Durathil closed his eyes for just a moment as his memories took him back to the lemon groves of Tentagir. That fond memory of home was shattered as Durathil's opening vision locked onto a single yellow eye that was as large as his own form. As if summoned by the very essence of the mountain, Mahatan Artorian appeared before him, a majestic yet terrifying draconic behemoth of blood-red scales, each the size of an elven shield his presence magically commanding the attention of the Archmage as Durathil found himself ensnared in the gaze of the ancient dragon. As the stunned elf stared uncontrollably, paralyzed by the effects of dragon fear, something approaching a smile lifted from the corners of the massive draconic maw, exposing rows of glistening fangs, each the size of the elf's own sword. The dragon, knowing the elf's surprise, wore a look of satisfaction and seemed almost amused. <laughs> you have much to learn of dragons, little one. The great dragon rumbled, punctuating his comment with a wisp of sulfur and brimstone-scented smoke. We have wings, yes, but we also have legs. People always expect to be warned by the crash of heavy claws or the clanking of armored scales, when in truth, no mountain cat walks in greater silence. With perfect timing, the dragon's wings unfurled with a powerful heavy rhythm as Mahat Nartorian rose into the air, ever holding the elf frozen with his hypnotic gaze. The dragon then approached closer, lifted his horned head, and sniffed about the air. Hmm. There is interesting magic about, elf. Yours? Durathil nodded, despite his attempt to resist the dragon's compelling magic irresistible. Mahat Nartorian settled in close to his prey, tucking his front paws under his chest and wrapping his tail around his impressive red scale covered body. Durathil, feeling like a trapped mouse, could not help but look upon the mighty dragon's posture and demeanor as that of a bored house cat playing with its food. This likely would have been the end of our story had not the great story trope of arrogance worthy of any Bond villain not made its presence known. But forgiven in this tale, after all, it happened 25,000 years ago. But regardless of time or place, the result was the same as the master of the mountain spoke. Hmm, I am curious, little one. You have waited so patiently for my arrival. I would like to see what magic you've prepared. Do your best, little mage, but don't look so surprised or hopeful. The best wizards of the south could do nothing to harm me. I am far too powerful for your kind. In that moment, Durathil felt the dragon's grip on his mind fade. As soon as he could move, the elf tore his gaze from the dragon and reached for a small bag on his belt. Durathil drew forth an engraved cube and invoked its unholy gift, chanting the dark words of the evil god Ganador. 
For a brief moment, the dragon's bemused look betrayed a concern. Perhaps he expected to recognize the incantations of a spell that now sounded very foreign to the dragon. Hurling the artifact at the dragon, the fist-sized cube impacted with an uninspiring, almost comical splat against the armored scales covering the dragon's flank. In doing so, it released a viscous, virulent green goo, likely feeling no different to the dragon than countless bugs and insects that experience the same fate during high-speed dragon flight. The puzzled dragon had just begun to mock the elf for this anticlimactic ending when Mahat Nartorian abruptly felt a sudden, deep, magical chill sharp as the teeth of a white dragon, somehow stabbing through his impenetrable scaled armor. Looking closely at the substance again, he realized the slimy green splotch was slowly spreading. Now alarmed, the dragon reached out with the spiked tip of his tail to scrape the substance off, but to his shock, his tail stuck fast when it touched the goo, becoming trapped by this strange otherworldly glue. Releasing a rage-filled roar, the panicked dragon reared up on his powerful legs and began frantically tearing at the now swiftly spreading green substance with his front claws, again to no avail. Now fully recognizing the peril he was in, Mahat Notorian spread his wings, pounding the air violently as he struggled to take flight towards the safety of his lair. But it was all over in moments, as the master of the mountain found himself completely encased inside an elastic, viscous green cube of godlike power tightly trapping the enraged dragon within its confines, giving the dragon no release no matter how violently he battered himself against its supernatural walls. It took a few minutes until the infuriated dragon resigned himself to the inevitable and settled down, though wisps of smoke still curled from his flared nostrils. Finally, the mass of draconic jaws moved very slightly as if attempting to speak or issue commands. There was a moment of silence as the visible ripple of sound had to pass through the arcane cubed prison to resonate outside its walls. When the now subdued dragon's words reached Durathil's keen elven ears, they were oddly distorted and mutated. The once deep, terrifying, and thunderous draconic tones were muffled and transformed until the mighty dragon's speech now wobbled forth with its slurred, muttering cadence more resembling that of a drunken dwarf, only serving to further diminish the dragon's once fearsome presence. Nevertheless, the dragon's words were understandable enough, and in that moment, Durathil could not hide his grin, knowing that they were now negotiating on more level terms. Through the profane magic of Ganador, Durathil gained his leverage, and he negotiated with the imprisoned dragon. The elf wanted a viable silver dragon egg. While there was trickery of words early in negotiation, Durathil was quick to catch and call out the dragon's deceitful attempt. Upon the dragon's discovery that his prison was the magic of a god such as Ganador, and with it the realization of the existential peril he was actually in, the dragon fully relented. In a bid to negotiate his release, the once again defeated dragon, having already proved he would keep honor-bound agreements, proposed a binding pact one that elven wisdom detected was tinged with genuine respect. Now engaging in negotiations of truth, the red dragon offered to hunt down and slay a silver she-dragon, one he knew possessed such an egg, acquiring it for the elf and even allowing appropriate time to bond with the silver hatchling. But his price was not trivial. In return, the dragon would demand that Durathil deliver on to the master of the mountain, the moon elf Charlario, to this very plateau mountain top. In exacting his long-awaited revenge for his banishment, Mahat Notorian declared, honor bound, that he would consider this a bargain well made, and that further, the death of the moon elf would sate his elven revenge, promising that upon Charlario's death, the rest of the forest elves would also be free of his reign of terror. Durathil was initially reluctant to give another elven life in such a bargain, despite the greater good it would serve. Mahatnartorian countered with the wisdom of an ancient predator, 
the dragon instantly sensing the darkness and ambition, now corrupting the very essence of the former prince. Fueled by the same hunger for power and control that guided the gold elf to accept insidious bargains from such as dark a force as Ganador in the first place. To further drive this pact to acceptance, the dragon masterfully exposed the obvious to an elven mage that was either naive or in full denial. Durathil was in a precarious position as there was still an unavoidable and inevitable price that Ganador's power would now demand of the conflicted elf, a life for a life. Which, according to the canonical story, as I've discussed in Chapter 8, was surprising to Durathil, stating that the Gold Elf former prince stood silent, stunned, and shamed beyond speech upon this realization, claiming that he had known only that Ganador was an ancient power, one who had sought him out and offered assistance in his quest to aid and rule his people. Maybe he should have seen Ganador's evil nature. Maybe he should have known what sort of service the god would require of him. He should have, but he did not, so blinded was he by his desire for power. But that desire in and of itself was not evil, surely not, he thought. Well, I'm not buying it personally, and I bet the dragon didn't either. There's a good chance the historical account conveniently omitted the mockery that the red dragon likely let loose but I shall leave that judgment for each of you. And so it was written that with a heavy heart and a sense of resignation, Durathil agreed to the dragon's terms, to trade the life of his fellow elf, perhaps friend, for the promise of a silver dragon egg. But he did so with a final caveat. Durathil would require more time, only agreeing to secretly betray and sacrifice the life of Charlario after he was able to train the hatched dragon. That or Dorothil would offer himself to Ganador in 20 years time. It was but a gamble for time, a glimmer of hope that he could perhaps find another alternative solution. Mahatan Artorian agreed and a second bargain was then struck. Dorothil knew that his actions would have far reaching implications for both himself and his people. As he chanted the final incantation to release the dragon from his arcane prison, he braced himself for the uncertain future that he knew awaited him. The dragon departed with smug satisfaction, while Durathil was left only with the ashes of his own honor. Charlario Moonflower, having spotted the return of the behemoth dragon in his travels, quickly returned home from a tornash to learn that Durathil had been able to trap the Red Menace. While certainly relieved, Charlario was also puzzled, knowing that elven magic was mostly ineffective against such a creature. He concluded that Durathil must have wielded his power with exceptional control, a hallmark of true greatness. After many months, Charlario and Durathil began talking about the future of their civilization, musings of alliances between elves and dragons, and over time, some might posit they became friends. Eventually, Durathil let the moon elf in on his secret, leading Charlario to a hidden chamber within his magical tower within a tree. There, he shared his creation of a vast, illusionary replica of the mountain plateau, a pocket plane and inside this magic plane lay an enormous silver dragon egg. It was at this time that Durathil revealed his intentions to bond with the hatchling and train it to become Faerun's first dragon rider, and following that, establish an army of such powerful pairs of good and just dragons and elven riders to vanquish the forces of evil, draconic or otherwise. After much discussion over many weeks, Charlario agreed to give Durathil his aid in this noble endeavor. Years passed as Durathil and Charlario nurtured Silvery Wing, the unoriginal name for an otherwise magnificent silver dragon. The creature's intelligence and thirst for knowledge surpassed even elven standards, and she formed a deep bond with her mentors. Durathil, ever the visionary, began devising spells and strategies uniquely suited to the partnership of dragon and elf. Finally, as the calendars closed in on nearly two decades, all confined to Durathil's pocket dimension, Silvery Wing was ready to take flight in the realm of Faerun. 
Durathil sent Charlario ahead with an orb of scrying in order to scout out our now well-established location, the High Mountain Top Plateau. With the orb, they could communicate and relay wind conditions for the Silver Dragon's first flight. However, no sooner had Charlario reached the summit than a familiar roar thumbed through the early morning air. Charlario's nightmare became reality. Mahat Nartorian broke from the clouds high above, diving toward the moon elf in a bloodlust-filled rush. Exposed out in the open, Charlario knew there was no time to flee. Instead, he resigned to draw his sword to earn a warrior's death. But the dragon was not content with a quick kill. Instead, he slowed to toss a small round object upon the mountaintop. The moon elf dodged as shards of glass and prismatic sparks of magic exploded upon the stone, the remnants of an orb of scrying now lying at his feet. Charlario's eyes widened as he instantly realized its meaning. He stared in knowing disbelief as the red dragon's mocking laughter rolled out over the mountain range. Charlario had steeled himself for death in the flames of the master of the mountain, but the moon elf was ill-prepared for the intense stab of pain this betrayal now brought him. Though the former prince had made no secret of his opinion that gold elves were innately superior to all others, during the years that the two had worked together they had become partners, even friends, or so Charlario thought. The despaired moon elf slowly walked toward the center of the plateau. There he placed his own scrying orb upon the molten rock surface. He wanted to ensure that the treacherous Durathil might see and savor his triumph of treason. Then, with a deliberate smile, he drew his sword again and waited for the dragon, waited for his duplicitous death. Mahat Nartorian began to circle. Charlario had learned enough of dragons to understand what was coming. The Red Menace was gathering his power, stoking his internal flames for a blast of terrible magnitude. The Moon Elf waited, resigned to his end. This was not how he wished to present himself before his gods, but the choice was not his to make. Just as he was to close his eyes and recite a prayer to the elven pantheon of Arvindor, he caught the flash of a silver streak, almost invisible against the clouds. In another heartbeat, his disbelief was turned as the majestic silver dragon charged headlong at her target, flying like a loosed arrow toward the much larger red dragon. The Moon Elf's lips whispered in agonized denial as the wondrous silver dragon he had trained and loved plummeted toward the red dragon's back. But before she could even slash at Mahatnatorian's leathery wings, the great dragon rolled in mid-flight to seize the young silver dragon in his taloned grip. The two dragons spun together, each grappling for a killing hold. But there would be no fairy tale victory for the far smaller silver this day. It was, by any measure, a battle of unequals. Silvery Wing's head fell back as the light left her eyes, her graceful neck nearly sundered in two by the red dragon's mighty jaws. Her shimmering, iridescent wings fell limp as her body began to fall from the red dragon's talons. But just as Mahat Nartorian turned his gaze back to Charlario for his revenge, the silver dragon's fall abruptly stopped. Her lifeless body now seemed to hang, even bounce as if suspended by a magical, flexible cord. The red dragon turned and immediately let loose a knowing shriek of rage that cracked the very molten stone beneath Charlario's feet. Mahat Nartorian, enraged, struggled in panic and vain to rid himself of the silver dragon's corpse. What started as a bright green tether between the red dragon and his kill, was now rapidly spreading up and around the massive red wings, the red dragon summoning every ounce of his immense strength, straining to remain aloft. But within moments, the red dragon's flight slowed, grew ever sluggish, and then, in an instant, his grand crimson wings ceased to move at all, as both creatures, now in a tethered death spiral, plummeted rapidly from several thousand feet above toward the mountain below. The Moon Elf turned to flee, half running, half sliding down the slope and away from the impact. No sooner had he cleared the plateau than a tremor shuddered through the mountain, nearly throwing him down into his own death. When all was still and silent, the Moon Elf made his way back up to the plateau to bid the Silver Dragon farewell. 
To his astonishment, three beings lay shattered on that mountaintop, each enjoined and intertwined by an odd web of viscous green substance. Mahatan Artorian had hit the mountain first, and his body was crushed upon the mountain and under Silverwing's own weight. Durathil was still astride her back. Charlario approached, assessing the extent of his injuries. Gazing upon the gold elf's grievously wounded form, Charlario realized that any attempts to heal would be futile. The elf's chest bore the marks of utter devastation, every bone shattered beyond repair. Durathil spoke with weakening breath as a crimson foam escaped his mouth, first cautioning Charlario to wait for Ganador's dark magic to fade, spoken in a knowing admission of the tainted, dark burden he now carried. This was followed by a demand that Charlario continue their mission by training others, Charlario solemnly pledging to fulfill the prince's dying wish. In a moment of understanding, Charlario, conflicted at the knowledge of the dark path Durafil had taken, mixed with his final, selfless, perhaps even noble act, absolved the Gold Elf of any guilt as the troubled Prince of Tintagir crossed into the divine realm of Arvandor. Years later, Charlario reflected upon the profound significance of Durathil's final dark truths. Forever troubled by them, he still recognized the complexity of those choices made, the embracing lure of darkness even with noble intentions. Ultimately choosing to keep those dark secrets from his fellow elves, believing a legacy better served to shape future generations as a heroic act rather than one marked with the stains of evil. As we wrap up the lore of this tale, I have a question for each of you. Is Durathil a hero or a villain who made a final lunge at a noble end? Personally, I have some significant reservations regarding his interactions with Ganador. Perhaps I can be convinced that the prince did not seek out the Dark God. Perhaps. But that an intelligent archmage of supposed good alignment, being so naive as to think a chaotic evil god would freely offer assistance without wanting anything sinister in return, well, that might be straining the leash of credibility a bit far for me. Ganador doesn't present himself shrouded in trickery, like for instance a harvester devil might. We have a power-hungry former prince, now stripped of his crown, agreeing to a bargain with a god known to favor gelatinous cubes, black puddings, and gibbering mouthers. I mean, there's no ambiguity here. This is the acceptance of evil incarnate. And then later compounding that issue by outright promising to sacrifice the life of a fellow elf without the moon elf having any knowledge of doing so. So at the very least, he's a terrible friend, and yes, I agree it's a stretch to even call them friends, it's something that's arguable, but if Durathel still cared for his people in the same way he did as the young prince on Tentagir, then would he not be forever indebted to Charlario for his part in saving his people during his absence? My takeaway is that Durathil valued the restoration of the power and status of his birthright above all else, and that any honorable or noble outcomes are just a byproduct of his ambition. House Durathil has a checkered history, no doubt, but the prince's actions, in my opinion, stand on their own as sinister at best. And to close out my thoughts, we end the story with what is clearly the inarguable sacrifice of his life, a noble act to be sure. But even that is tainted by another sacrifice, that of the Silver Dragon. Am I being too harsh here? Would love to have your opinions. Do let me know. But hey, on the bright side, I am once again on a second reading now, really finding this story fascinating, and it has enough lore gaps for some really creative homebrew. I've already made some initial and informal notes for a future Adventure Pack PDF, so you can look for that on my Patreon shop sometime soon, and of course you can join for free. Links below. Finally, I wanted to share some nuggets of lore we didn't have time to elaborate on for one reason or another. As promised to reveal early in the volume, the lore and story we covered today take place in the span of just over three centuries. This begins with the arrival on the yet-to-be-named region of Torel we know today as Faerun, after the destruction of the elven homeland Tentagir up until Durathil's death. 
Even after this hour-plus lore volume, there is much connected story and lore, most of which that lead into other historic elven events that required I set them aside for future volumes. But just to tease one of those as an example, we have Charlario's encounter with Isla Strye and the story it will take us to in a future profile. With Durathil as the first dragon rider being the subject of our lore and focus today, one of the aspects that we didn't cover was Charlario's incessant travel across the realm to other elven settlements. History properly credits Charlario's efforts to align all the variant elves that migrated to the realms in these early days. Upon one of his journeys with his son Kornath, the chaotic good drow goddess and daughter of Lul, Isla Strye, came upon the traveling pair. The goddess, knowing they were seeking alliances with other elven tribes, warned them of the dangers hidden within the Illithiri elves of a Tornash to the south. These were the dark elf descendants of those that would later become known as the drow. Charlario did travel to a Tornash, and there he met a significant figure, their leader, a dark elf archmage named Carnarlist, which in and of itself is a quite compelling story. Isla Strye told Charlario and his son that the people of a Tornash would soon begin to worship the evil god Veyron, who is of course her brother and the son of her mother, the demon queen herself, Lolth. I find this interesting as it is one of the earliest mentions of Veyron following the War of the Seldarine. Isla Strye even mentions in the lore that Charlario has probably not heard of Veyron as he just recently became a god, strongly intimating that the people of Atornash were to be his first worshippers. It should also be noted here that at the time of this story, Atornash actually worshipped Ganador, bringing us back full circle. The history of Carnarlist, a Tornash, and their stories and interactions with the abyssal goddess Loth are quite interesting, and I suspect we'll be doing a full lore volume on its history sometime sooner than later. Well over 90% of the information I shared with you today was taken from the really only original and plentiful canonical source, at least that I'm aware of. I've mentioned the book a couple of times already, but I do want to make sure to give proper credit that it's given to Elaine Cunningham's excellent novel, Evermeet Island of Elves, and I created this one hour plus volume with just a sliver of that book. It takes a bit more time to create a profile like this from a novel, and as you can see, it generally gets pretty expanded, but most of the video stories I've seen regarding this particular tale are basically a rehash of the Realms Wiki something I really try to avoid unless I just need a site. Besides, I wanted to provide something deeper and complete, and that simply wouldn't have been possible without me reading this book again and using it as the primary source for our work today. So, I hope you enjoyed. All right, that's it for Volume 5, but let me close with a final question for you out on a poll in the Community tab. What are your thoughts on this format? Or more importantly, would you like to see more expanded lore from the fantasy novels that cover information that might be more obscure or even unavailable in our normal resource books? I would love to get your feedback on that, and I hope you will join me for Volume 6. If you'd like to support the channel, please check out the links below, and if you think I earned it, please like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.